great service in Clyde. I tell you, we're just seeing good things happening in Clyde. Y'all keep praying for Clyde. We're believing for just salvations and miracles and healings and things to happen there that's just going to turn that city on its ear. We're glad to be joining with some other great uh, kingdom people in Clyde. Um, we're just believing for revival, not only for Abilene, but for Clyde and Merkel and Aspermont and Sweetwater and Anson. Come on. Jim Ned and Winters. How about the big country? Will that work? Good stuff. Well, why don't you stand with me? Grab your Bibles. We're going to go right to the Word this morning. Decided to share this Word, part two. Lawless. Say lawless. lawless. Aren't you glad we came out of the law and we are living under grace here today? Come on, just hold your Bibles. I'll hold your swords up. Father, thank you for the Word. Thank you that this is the truth. Because Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the Word made flesh, and the Word is the truth. And your Word says that the truth will set you free. So, Father, thank you for freedom today. Thank you for removing spiritual cataracts so that we might see clearly, so that our vision might not be impaired to our purpose and to our destiny. Let your Word change us today, Father. In Jesus' name, can you say amen? God bless you. You may be seated. I'm excited to bring part two uh, of our series, Lawless, this morning. The title of my message this morning is A Beautiful Exchange. Um, last, uh, two weeks ago, actually, David had a good word. This, this is a series that David put together. We're really excited about kind of how we're doing uh, our three different services. Uh, we're, we're developing a preaching team. Uh, Clyde, uh, we, we just felt the conviction that we weren't going to kind of do a video campus. We wanted there to be like a real live uh, blood person there that has blood running through their veins, a human being preaching. And so that's kind of how we've chosen to do that. So, But to do that, we had to develop a preaching team. And so, man, the guys have done a great job. I, it's pretty interesting. I mean, I, I've been loafing, y'all. I, I, this is my first time to preach in five weeks. So y'all didn't even miss that, though, did you? Didn't at all, because it's been so good lately. Uh, last week, our Holy Spirit Conference, Jack Taylor, and then Pastor David before that, our, our Blessed Life series. But it's neat for me to see kind of a team being developed. And so David created, developed this series called Lawless, and it's fun for me to get to preach his, his material. I, listen, I, I, Ed Young says this, he says, if you have eyes, plagiarize. <laughs> so, man, I could take anybody's message and preach it like it's my own. And so this is a good word, David. I just want to commend you on that. A great outline, and I kind of added some meat to the bones. But I want to talk about lawless. Now, just quickly to review, the purpose of this series uh, is to remind ourselves that it's, it's not by works that we're saved. Can you say amen? Uh, come on, it's not by works that we're delivered. We don't get breakthrough by works. <laughs> Our breakthrough comes because of faith. Jesus says, or God says, that there's only one way to please God, and we only can please Him by faith. God is pleased by faith. Faith is what pleases God. You can't please God without faith. Can I say to you, our works will never please God. You're not good enough. You're not handsome enough. You're not educated enough. Okay? Only faith. It's only by faith that we can please God. Anything done outside of faith, therefore, is the law. David talked uh, two weeks ago about double standards. Um, he made this point. We walk in anxiety, worry, doubt, whatever it is. That's not faith. That's the law. Temptation only has power in the places that you're not fully trusting God. What a statement. Let me say it again. Temptation only has power in the places where you're not fully trusting God. Places where you've created a double standard. Okay? So... Uh, you can't live by double standard. That's, uh, that's not by works of the law that, are, that make us whole. It's, it's the faith that makes us whole. God cannot be the source of our strength if he's not first the source of our standard. What's your standard? Who's created your standard? He made two points that I thought were really good. This is just review again. Number one, the law can only limit. How many of you know that's true? He said this, God gave Ten Commandments, but then man took those Ten Commandments and created 614 laws. It's crap. It just hit me when he said that. That's why I just cracked up. Oh, my gosh, it's true. You see, the truth is, 
that there's no man able to fulfill those laws. See, the law was created to prove that we couldn't live by it. The law was put in place on purpose. The law was put in place to say to you and I, you can't do this. You're not, you just can't do this. Then Jesus came and what did Jesus do? Jesus came to do what? Not to do away with the law, it's in the word of God. Jesus came to fulfill the law. So Jesus, come on, have you know, he could, he could fulfill every act, every statement, every law there is. Jesus fulfilled that. Jesus was obedient to that. So because he did that, he fulfilled the law. Now he lives in us. Therefore, we fulfilled the law, not because of our own works, but by faith in the God who saved us, in Jesus who delivered us and set us free, because he fulfilled it. Now he lives in me, therefore I fulfill it. Is that okay? <laughs> aren't you glad that we aren't having to do all these things to try to get into God's good graces? Jesus took care of all that for us. Now we get to live by faith in him. We get to know him in relationship. Our only part in this, and it's a huge part, it's a relationship. We have to be intentional about our relationship with him. We need to spend time with him, but it's not out of a sense of works. Not doing it because we have to, but because we want to. We're so crazy and we're so in love with him that we can't help ourselves but to spend time. I had a great visit with Ashley last night. And she just said, you know, Pastor, I've just been in a season. We all do this. We're just, it's been dry. And, you know, just, and I realized that I just wasn't spending that time. And she said, man, I'm telling you. It, it was just, I watched her light up. She said, I've just had times with the Lord that have just been incredible. And I just feel like he's just, you know, that there's that warmth, that intimacy relationship with him. Come on, see, that is the, the beauty of our, our walk with him. When we live with him, when we love him, he then is in us. And we don't have to live in shame and guilt and all these other things. Seek first his kingdom and all of these other things will be added to you. If we just fix Hebrews 12, our eyes on him, everything else is okay. I mean, you know the world will be falling apart, but if your eyes are fixed on him, it's going to be all right. Amen? I love that. He said this second, the point he made was we need to raise the right standard. Either way, you can't live by two standards. So the question is, who's, who's, who's setting your standard? That's a good question. Who's setting your standard? Um, temptation can only come into your heart when you're not living by the right standard. Okay? So we need to allow Christ to set our standard. Our relationship with him needs to be the standard. Look in your Bibles. Turn to Galatians 3 with me. Go to verse 10. Galatians 3. Verse 10, we're going to read our text again, and then we're really focus on verse 13. The verse 10 says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. Let me say it again. No one is justified, come on, what does it say? Before God by the law. I mean, no, the law don't cut it. The righteousness, though, shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Then we're going to focus on verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Can you say amen? We can close our Bible. We can bow our heads, say a prayer, and go home right there. But we're not going to. How do you do that? By becoming a curse for us. For it is written, everyone cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. We know Jesus on the cross was hung on a tree. Now, I don't know about you, but even today, as I share this scripture, I read this scripture, I've read it over the years, I have a hard time wrapping my brain around that thought that Jesus became a curse for you and I, for me. Anybody else struggle with that besides me? <laughs> Pure sinless, spotless lamb, that Jesus, he who knew no sin, became sin on our behalf. That's what the Word of God says. You know, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, he no doubt was in a place of great angst. Father, not my will, but yours. And, and certainly as a human, because he was a human, who had emotion, who felt pain, 
He knew what was ahead of him at Calvary. He knew what was ahead of him on that cross. That death was a very cruel death. He knew that was coming, but I think even more concerning to him, more weighing in on him, the greater cause of that angst in him was the thought, the truth, that he was about to take on the sin of humanity onto his shoulders. Now just think about it for a minute. It says that in that place of, of great angst and stress and just, ah, uh, he began to push inwardly. And as he did, this is a medical fact, literally through his pores, blood began to come out. Are you out there? Oh, what a love. What a love. What love is this, that Christ would die for me while I'm a sinner, that Christ would take on my sin, that he would love me so much that he would take upon himself the sin of the world. Come on, somebody. What a good God we serve. What love, what love, what love, what love is this? Powerful. Here's three points. First one's this. Where God found us. Where did God find you? Well, he found us all. We were lost in our sin. You might have been on the back row of a church or the, the, the back wall of a club. You, I don't know where you, how many of you remember where you were when he found you? We all do. We were lost. Come on, CJ. We were lost in our sin, headed toward eternal damnation with no hope but God. But God in his great love for us reached down into the muck and the mire of our life and he pulled us up and he received us and he embraced us and he forgave us as we responded to his love. He found us in a lost state. He found us in a sinful, kind of a sinful nature, if you will. Look at this scripture, John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 31 says, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth. And what will the truth do? And the truth will do what? Set you free. They answered him and said, well, verse 33, we are, we are Abraham's descendants. There's still a religious mindset. All the years they'd ever known as being good Jewish believers, a good Jewish law-abiding uh, citizens. We are Abraham's descendants have, have you, and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Can I say to you that the saddest place in a person's life is when a person thinks they're free, but they're really not free. That's the truth. These disciples are like, what do you mean? We're not a slave to anything. We're free. We're not, we're not slaves. And the, the enemy's very subtle. And uh, he, he, if, if we're not aware of his tactics, of his schemes, he comes to kill and to steal and to destroy. If we're not aware, then he very subtly is able to kind of you know, blind our eyes to the truth. And that certainly is the case here. And Jesus answered and said this to them. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Well, sin enslaves us, church. Everyone who commits it. So we're, we're in this sinful nature, we're in this place, and in this place that Christ came to rescue you and I. Sin defined, I've shared this before, the word's an interesting word. The word is ha 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 hamartia, hamartia. And it just simply means to miss the mark. Say miss the mark. I, uh, I was going to just be cute, do an illustration, bring my compound bow this morning and, and, uh, and, and kind of illustrate my sermon. But I probably would have sent the arrow through the wall and that would have been good. I'd have gotten in trouble for that. So I brought a target instead. How many of you know that that bullseye is the mark? How many of you know that God has a mark for our lives? He has a purpose for us. And that purpose is a bullseye. It's the, it's the revelation of why we're here. The revelation of our destiny. Come on, church. And so when we sin, we miss the mark. So you see that little mark right there? Just right up here. Y'all see that? That's way back there. You see the little, little mark? Now, I didn't miss it by far. 
but I missed it nonetheless. Then, boy, I felt bad, and I just came before the Lord. I think the word says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us and to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Y'all happy about that? Then I got right with God, and then I turned around, and I got stupid again. And then I really missed the mark right up here, barely on the target. Y'all see that right up there? How many of you know the truth is this? Man, that's a screamer right there. He's going to let everybody know he's here. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Did y'all ever have, did you ever have, I digress. Did you ever have a child in the cereal aisle when they lost control like that? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Why is it always the cereal aisle? And then why, do the, why does a grocery store always put the sugariest cereal right at their reach? Anyway. <laughs> Come on. That, well, by the way, that, maybe that doesn't, that, that's a sin nature, them children doing that right there. They don't, they're not trained how to do that. They just know how to, they just do it naturally, don't they? But then the second time, I, keep, I really missed the mark up here. Now, can I just say this to you? Missing the mark is missing the mark. Whether I miss it big or I miss it little, sin is sin. Sin keeps us from our bullseye, from our purpose. Now I would say that maybe this one over here does a little more distance to the bullseye. I would just say all that is is there's just a greater consequence for some, some sin than there is other sins. That's the only difference. Y'all know what I'm talking about? There are consequences that we pay for sin. And when we, when, we, when we miss it bad up here, they're a little greater than when we miss it over here. That's the only difference. But the point is this. It's missing the mark. Sin, sin separates us God's love. So I just wanted us to see that again this morning. Romans 5 verse 8. It's such a good scripture. Look at this if you've got your Bibles. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. It says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. How many before Christ, we were enemies. Before Jesus, we were enemies because of the sin in our life that had separated us from God. But Christ came to reconcile us, to bring us into right relationship with the Father. Christ died for us. He came then. He reconciled us to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Woohoo! Yippee, as, as my friend uh, over here would say, Latimer, yippee, come on, that's a yippee right there. I'm glad that I've been saved by his life. I don't know about you, but I'm telling you, I'm glad that God sent his son to pay the price for the penalty of my sin. There are four statements I want to make about sin that's important. We're talking about where he found us. Four, four statements. Uh, they, they're, 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 here they are. Number one, sin, sin can never be an excuse. When we sin, when we miss the mark, we have to learn how to, uh, as the conviction of the Holy Spirit, deal, because I mean, when you sin, you feel conviction. You feel the pain of that, or you should. If you don't feel the pain of it, then you're in big trouble. <laughs> but you feel the pain of that sin, and so in that place, you feel the pain of what you've done to the heart of God and those that have that have been affected by your sin. And so you come into that place of confessing that. But see, if you get to the place where you're like, you know what? Yeah, okay, I made a mistake, but, and you don't own it. You don't take responsibility for your sin. You don't recognize then that sin is a condition that you were born with. And that it's something that you've got to allow the love of Christ, the blood of Jesus to come and redeem and forgive you for instead of kind of pointing to someone else when you don't own it i don't think listen if you don't own that sin you can't be forgiven for that sin is that okay to say um you got to take responsibility second about sin sin is is not inevitable i, I hate the thought well bless god I, i'm just a sinner saved by grace uh you know i'm just uh, what, what's the bumper sticker with the apple with the bite out of it uh uh, Y'all seen that bumper sticker? I'm the only one in this room that's seen that bumper sticker. Uh, I'm just, it's something like a, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Bless God. I'll be happy with a little, little shack in heaven. That's all I need. 
Come on, shut up. That's not who we are. Come on, church. If we wake up thinking sin's inevitable, well, that's such a stupid thing. It's like, well, might as well just get up and kind of be intentional about sinning that day. Well, I think this is what I'm going to do today to sin. I think I'll go out and just do a little road rage today. I'm in the, I'm in the mood for a little road rage today. I think I'll try that today. I'm going to be intentional about my road rage today. Hey, is that stupid? Of course it is. Sin is a choice we make. We make the choice to sin or not. The Bible says, Jesus says, look, uh, be holy as I am holy. What's he saying? He's calling us to a higher standard. He's calling us to the bullseye. Come on, y'all. He's always calling us to the bullseye. There's a bullseye for you and I that I believe we can hit. Yeah. All right. A few of you are convinced. The rest, I'm not so sure. Here's the third thing. Sin's not categorized in levels of behavior. I kind of already pointed that out. It's simply our separation from God. Sin is sin. Four, sin brings immediate gratification. How many you know this truth? Sin is fun for a season. Woo! But its long-term effect, <laughs> come on, is devastation, destruction. Hey, it's death. Kim and I were coming back from Rio Dosa yesterday. We had to go through Lubbock. And we were at Quaker in the Loop. And it just so happens to be a Krispy Kreme donut place. <laughs> and I said, you know, honey, here's the deal. This is when I opened the door for the devil. When I said, you know, honey, I said, let's get, let's get a box of donuts for the kids. Let's take them back. Can I just submit to you? You can't put a box of crisp, come on. You cannot put a box of crisp and great donuts in your car and not eat one. But see, I thought, I thought, you know, I'm a man of God. I can do this. So as I was eating my donut, uh, <laughs> I said to Kim, you know, this thing tastes real good right now. This thing, I'll tell you, you do too many things, they'll kill you. I know Krispy Kreme is out to kill you. You will go into a diabetic coma if you eat too many things. See, sin is fun for us. See, there's a price to be paid. It tasted good. It feels good. It's fun. Oh, this is awesome. But you wake up the next morning. Are y'all out there? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Okay, good. Not good, <laughs> but good that we're getting our eyes open to what sin can do to us. Uh, here's a, here's a, a cool thing. We, you know, the, 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 here's the truth. Uh, through the, the price that was paid by Jesus, he uh, made available, he gave us then access to the Holy Spirit. Y'all happy about that? We had a great conference last weekend. Our Holy Spirit conference was tremendous uh, and, and just was so good. And, and, and it was just so many people touched, filled with the Holy Spirit, coming into the power of the Holy Spirit. People healed. Just had a great, great weekend. And I was thinking about John chapter 16 where Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because he's like, if I don't go, then I can't send the helper to you. Now, who's the helper? It's the Holy Spirit. The, the great Greek word, compound word, that means he's called alongside us. He comes as our helper. He comes as the truth, our comforter, alongside us. I mean, we need, I mean, you know, we need the Holy Spirit to come alongside us. And then it says of the Holy Spirit that he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So here's the thing. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, walk in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But one of the most powerful things the Holy Spirit does for us is that he is that guard. He is that, that uh, conviction of God over us, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. When we are tempted to sin, he's there very lovingly going, don't do that. This is not good. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. You've been in those moments and then the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes the conviction comes after the, you eat the donut. You know what I'm talking about. But the conviction's there. That's the Holy Spirit. I love that about his gift uh, uh, to us through the Holy Spirit. Here's the second point. What he became for us. And already kind of touched on that just a little bit. He became the curse for us. He traded places uh, with us. God didn't just clean our slate, but he gave us Jesus' slate. Can somebody say amen? amen? Jesus did not just die for our sins. He became our sin. He took it upon himself. A word that I've shared here before with you guys. It's a big kind of a 
theological word, but it's important for us to understand. I believe this to be the truth. I believe we are going to move into a season. We've had uh, those seasons, I think, in the 60s when there was a Jesus movement and, and people, all the Jesus freaks and Jesus people came into the uh, into relationship with Christ and that charismatic movement swept across the nation. Then in the 70s and 80s, uh, we, we saw a, a move of the Holy Spirit. We got into this place of encountering the Holy Spirit. I think it was Jack Taylor last week said, I believe that we're in a season where we're going to come into an understanding of God, of the Father. And I, I think that's really the season we're in. And it, because I, I think for so many of us, we've, we've seen God through our earthly father filter. And sometimes that's not so good. Hey, even as good as my daddy was, there's no way if I just saw God through my dad's filter, he'd still be woefully short of, of who he really is to me. I think we're in that season. I, I think for many of us raised religious, we kind of seen God as, as just this big, great haired old, long beard gentleman who just is waiting for us to mess up. That's not who he is. Come on, somebody. That's not who he is. And, and, I, and I think we, we need to understand why Jesus came and did what he did. I want to throw a big word out. The word is propitiation. Say propitiation. And I've shared this thought before, but it fits so perfectly here. Just a couple of scriptures. Romans 3.25 whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood is Jesus through faith to demonstrate his righteousness became then because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Hebrews 2.14. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. That's us. Jesus had to be made like us that he might be merciful and faithful, a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of of the people. First John 2 2. And he himself, Christ, is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now here's here's the definition of this word propitiation. It's very simple. It's the turning away of anger by the offering of a gift. Some of you might be like, well, you know, I'd argue that how can a loving God ever be angry? How could a God of love also be a God of anger? I get it. The Bible's clear. God is a God of love. God loves us with a pure and boundless love. He, he, there's, there's no limit to his love for us. Uh, he, he says that he desires that no man perish. Come on, we, we get it. He loves us. But it also says that because he loves his people so greatly, watch this. He, he's not indifferent when we soil creation with sin. When we bring misery into the lives of others because of our sin, there's something that has to be done with that sin. Or would you agree? And I'd suggest that his anger in that sense is more toward the sin than it is the sinner. But the sin and the sinner is connected. And God's saying, in fact, this anger in me has to be appeased because of the sin. It, it, it's an anger that it's not an irrational, kind of an irrational lack of self-control like we know anger. It's a... Let me say it this way. It's the settled opposition of his holy nature to everything that's evil. Are you getting this? You may need to go back and listen to this again. I, I, I hope you're okay. You guys good? Yeah. See, uh, such opposition to sin can't be kind of just dismissed with a wave of the hand. It, it requires something much more substantial. And the Bible states that it's only the cross that did this. Jesus is the propitiation. He went to the cross. He appeased the wrath of God toward our sin on that cross. And here's the good news. I tell you, because he's done that, it's done. His wrath can never be expressed toward us in that way any longer. Because Jesus came, he became the, the appeasement of that anger in God's heart. Now we can just know that this is a good God who's crazy about us. Bill Johnson says it all the time. He's in a good mood. He's not mad at you. Come on, this is proof positive of that truth today. Come on, can somebody hear me this morning? What he became for us. I could just hang out there for days. I mean, I just am amazed at the depth of his love for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So that in him we might become, whoo, come on, so that we might become the righteousness of God. 
in Christ. This is the beautiful exchange. He, cra well, he traded our sin for righteousness. He traded our pain for peace. He traded our misery for joy. He traded our problems into praise. That's good stuff. Finally, this as we close, who he's made us. Number three, who he's made us. Uh, there's a great Greek word here. It, it literally means for redeem. The word means to be bought with intent. When Jesus shed his blood for you and I, he was intentional. <laughs> he has, come on, he has a bullseye for each one of us here in this place today. And he was very thoughtful in that, in that price he paid. He, come on, how many, he made a great investment for you and I. We're not our own. He shed his blood on our behalf. And so he, he did it with intent. We were bought with intent. Jesus didn't just redeem us for eternal salvation, but he redeemed us for an earthly purpose. Come on. I love that. What a statement. I'm glad for salvation. Are you glad you're going to heaven? I'm so glad. That's going to be so great. It's going to be awesome. But you know what? There's a lot more on this earth. He redeemed you for an earthly purpose too. And I've been, when we begin to get into the reality of that truth, boy, it gets exciting, y'all. It gets exciting. Here's the scripture, Luke uh, chapter 5, verse 30. I want to read this to you real quick. Luke chapter 5, verse 30, the religious here questioning Jesus' decision to hang out with Levi and, and all of Levi's center friends. Levi was a tax collector, and they were really questioning Jesus. You need... You're not a very good judge of character. What are you doing hanging out with these lowlifes? It says, verse 30 of, of Luke chapter 5, it says, And their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, why, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Here's the truth. Jesus, aren't you glad? Jesus receives us right where we are. But he never intends for us to stay there. He'll take you right where you're at. Come on. Aren't you glad he took you right where you were? When you catch a fish, it's not clean. You got to clean it. Amen. He took us right where we were. He received us right where we're at. You see, your destiny isn't limited to where you've been or who you've been. Your destiny is in what you do with where you've been. See, while, you were, while, while your past is certainly part of defining your future, I mean, you know, your past had something to do with your future. It helped to define your future. You cannot, therefore, uh, just, uh, it, basically, you can't allow your past to become your future. It helped define it, but you can't become it. That's what I'm trying to say. Think about that. Man, when you go through the Word of God, I, I don't know about you, I get encouraged when I read the Bible. <laughs> I get encouraged when I read about Abraham, how he took matters into his own hands. Ishmael was born. Come on. But he refused to let go of the promise of God, and through him, God made a, a mighty nation. When I read about Isaac on the wrong end of his father's dagger, but didn't flinch at the promise of God over him. Jacob was deceptive. His name meant deception. These are, come on, can I just say to you, these are people just like you and me who made mistakes, who were goofballs, come on, who were goofy and just did things that weren't smart. Jacob did that. Robbed Esau of his birthright, and yet God's passion for him turned his life around. Joseph refused to let betrayal, the pit, prison to find his future. Instead, he chose to let those things shape him into the leader that he would become. Herding sheep wasn't King David's future. Come on, somebody. It was, however, what helped form David and the king that he became. He could go on and on. Hey, think about Saul, who became Paul, a religious zealot, oversaw the killing of many first Christian believers, first century believers, had an encounter with God that changed everything. And the rest is history. Come on, y'all, are, are you encouraged by this today? I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I have one word for you today, and it's this, but, I actually have two words for you, it's but God. I'm ever thankful for but God. 
How many of you have had a but God experience in your life? In all your nonsense and all your goofiness and all your mistakes, God says, boy, you're making me crazy. I love you. I love you. And I'm going to rescue you out of that, out of that quicksand that's going to kill you. And I'm going to give you every gift, every blessing, everything that will allow you to become who I've called you to become. You're going to start hitting the mark. You're going to start hitting the mark in Jesus. Now, I prophesy that over you today. You're going to start hitting the mark. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're going to start hitting the mark. Amen. What an incredible, incredible thing that we have in Christ today. He's made us to become, come on, victorious. Romans 8 says, we are overwhelming conquerors through Christ who loved us. First Peter says that I am a royal priesthood chosen generation i love i love the series that we see on netflix the crown you ever watch the crown it's pretty clean actually it's very clean for the most part i think now i'm telling you to go watch it and there's going to be something and y'all going to go oh that preacher needs to get saved before the <laughs> great series it's a true story queen elizabeth her story and just the whole thing about royalty and who they are and just all these things and and you can watch that, just kind of, just be in awe of that. Come on, can I just say to you, we're a royal priesthood. We're a chosen generation. We're a kingly nation. That's who we are. We're royal. We're royalty in Christ today. Well, it's good preaching, Pastor Scott. Love you guys. I want to just pray over you because here's my conviction. Here, here's my what's just kind of in my spirit this morning. I get so I get so frustrated when I see believers not living to their full potential, and it begins with me. <laughs> I get frustrated when I know I'm not living to my full potential. When I, you know, y'all know what I'm talking about. When you get to that point where you feel like there's a lid over you, you, you feel like you're just going along. Things are great, and you just bam, you hit that lid. You hit that ceiling. The word we got in early morning prayer this morning was breakthrough. I just, I just really believe that the Lord laid that on my heart today. That we're going to get some breakthroughs today. We're going to bust through that ceiling, man. The ceiling's created when we believe the lie of the enemy. When we allow the enemy to kind of come and pile, come on, shame and condemnation and guilt and all that stuff on us. And I just feel so heavy for some of you, and many of you today, that aren't hitting the mark because you're just like, it's like, why? You know, what's the use? Come on, don't, don't believe that. There's a purpose. There's a purpose. And the enemy sold you a bill of goods. He's lying to you to say that, you know what, you're going to always be this way. You'll always be a failure. You'll always He's a liar. Come on, he's the father of lies. Can I just say to you, it's his job to lie. That's what he does. But we have the truth, and what does the truth do? It sets us free. So bow your heads with me, and I just want to, I want to cover you guys in prayer as we leave this morning. And we're going to leave here a lot better than we came. All of us.